trust in his love I will trust the Lord Oh my soul Well let me uh, let me give a couple little caveats here this morning I, I believe God's going to do something very special something good um, I honestly have felt like there's been resistance coming our way this whole week, even this morning. I mean, our printer works beautifully for it, so for it to like, it's sending these new air messages I've never seen, and then it clogs like five times. I never even printed out my message. I had to like download a 99 cent one off of like lazypastor.com. So <laughs> we got all sorts of problems this morning. Uh, my wife's not here for some various health ailments. I, I got a and, she, you know, we're a team. It, it fiercely, seriously feels like, oh, man, the power is gone when she's not here. And, and, and just in the sense of, like, we are, we are a team, absolutely. And, uh, and then as well, like, I'll be honest, like, I can't get very excited today because I feel I, I, I probably, like, broke some ribs. And even in worship, it's like, I, I, I can't, like, it's like something's wrong. I, I want to shout. I want to dance. That's who I am for the Lord. And so if, you, if I feel a little subdued, it's because I don't want to, like, go to the ER, <laughs> okay, so it, like, right there, that was a pathetic laugh, I don't know what happened to myself, <laughs> even last night, we we're watching the Warrior game with my son, and I'm like, all right, I'm not going to respond, like, this is my emotions, all right, this is like, I'm not happy, this is a level one, all the way up to Steph Curry's breaking the three-point record, <laughs> level five, this is me dance, dancing with somersaults, you know, <laughs> so you got to kind of gauge my sermon like that this morning, honestly, uh, I think I pushed it a little bit too much uh, on Thursday, cheering for my son's basketball game, and and man, I, dizziness, pain, uh, tingling. I was almost in the ER, so it's been one of those weeks. So, anyways, I say that because that's real. It's real life, and also because I think the enemy hates this message that's coming. Yeah. This is a good. This is a good one. This is this is a really good one. So let's just jump in Isaiah nine six to seven. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and hold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So this is a very famous passage, that one that is a Christmas passage for good reason. It's a prophetic passage written about the coming Messiah hundreds of years before the Messiah came. And what stood out to me as I was doing my, my studies for for this Christmas season and really asking the Lord, what do you want us to hear this Christmas season as a church family of all the different ways to come about Christmas and to approach it in God's word? This one stood out. And we've been 15 years of being a full-time pastor for whatever reason. I've never in the Christmas season walked through this passage, but it, 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 was, it stood out where you kind of feel that that unction in the spirit, if you will, the, the wonderful counselor saying, hey, I'm highlighting this for a purpose. This is what I have for this Elevation Church family right now in this season. And really what stood out was where it started with his names. His names shall be called. And then there's four names. And what's so impactful to me about that is that all throughout God's word, names, particularly in that culture and that time, when you knew someone's name, it was not simply a, a, a meaningless identity marker, but you were getting to know their nature. That's why when, when Moses encountered God at the burning bush, he said, what is your name? Because your name carries your essence, your nature, your power. And if people want to have power over you, that's part of why they want to know what you're all about. What is your name? What nature do you carry? That's even why Jesus at times asked the name of the demons. Who am I dealing with here? Because once I know who I'm dealing with, I can appropriately adjust and have and demonstrate my power over that, over you, over the demons. And so names carry something that is far deeper in our culture. We kind of play with it a little bit where we might name someone uh, a, an inspiring name. And that's good. It's along those, lines, but along those lines. A lot of names don't have, in our culture, any deep significance. But that's not at all how it was in the Bible. 
A name carries someone's essential nature. And so what I love about that is when we, when we look at this passage, this prophetic passage about the names of the Messiah, what we can gather from that is that we know that in the Messiah coming to earth, God is desiring intentionally to reveal some very key aspects of God's nature. In other words, if life is all about knowing God, these are some of the core ways God wants to be known by you. Not in theory, but in practice, in life, in experience. Knowledge in the Bible is never about simply facts and information. It's about encounter and experience where you get transformed because it's so real. And so last week we looked at one of the names, the first name of (laughs) Wonderful Counselor. The incredible truth that God wants to be personal, present, and powerful. Like that counselor who is there that puts us in awe who both knows who what he knows what we're going through and he knows how to direct our steps most beautifully seen in the holy spirit where jesus said i am sending that counselor that helper who will live inside of you and he will show you everything he will teach you everything all the truth about who god is and so it's this incredible picture that god wants us to know him not as orphans in this world who are left tossed to and fro like what is life all about we don't know I don't know what to do I mean I even saw a a, a tragic article I think it was in the Atlantic newspaper by a pastor who summed up 2020 and 2021 and the headline was this we don't know what to do And and I'm not saying that there's no wrestling and there's no wondering and there's no questions but it was largely related to just the COVID mess and all that that produced. But what was tragic in there is that this pastor was saying, the state regulations have gotten really fuzzy. And so as a church, as leading the church, I just don't know what to do. Well, that's your problem right, right there. You have a wonderful counselor and it's not the state. It is, it is the risen Lord Jesus who has sent the Holy Spirit. It is Messiah who's come in the flesh. Now, so we have a wonderful counselor who never leaves us nor forsakes us. So that we're not supposed to just be blown about by every wind of doctrine and new idea and politically correct, you know, cool thing to do. No, we have the eternal word of God in the flesh who is now inside of us saying, here's my heart for you. Here's my will. Do this. Don't do that. Here's my direction. Stand up for me here. Go, go with me there. And that's, that's the beauty of the wonderful counselor. But it takes that confession of our heart like Mary demonstrated that says, God, I need you. The helper can't help you if you don't admit you need help. The counselor can't counsel you if you don't desperately know that you need counsel from above. And so that was last week, and God wants us to know him in that way. And as we move forward in this beautiful kind of sequence, if you will, of names of God, revealed nature of God, revealed in the Messiah, the next one we get is mighty God. So what does that mean? Oh, this, this, this one is incredible. The word mighty is, is gibor in the, in the Hebrew, and it means hero. I don't know why it doesn't get translated that way. That's cooler than mighty. It means champion. It means warrior. It means one who has shown great strength in battle, one who is victorious. A perfect example of God's people encountering the mighty God, the Gibor, the hero, the champion, and then responding with, with praise. I'm trying, I'm getting excited, so here we go. <laughs> responding with praise because of who God is, the mighty God is in the Exodus. First we see it in Moses, then we see it in Miriam. Let's pick it up, Exodus 15. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, 
For he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. And my Father's God, I will exalt him. The Lord, this is Yahweh, by the way. That's a name of God. Every time, anytime you see the Lord, all caps, in the Old Testament, that is the Hebrew word of Yahweh. So this is the word, this is the name that was revealed to Moses. So, G, so Moses is saying, Yahweh, check this out, verse 3, is a man of war. Yahweh is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk into the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. It is your right hand, O Yahweh, glorious in your power. Your right hand, O Yahweh, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries, your enemies. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. Then Miriam, it says, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand and all the women went out after her with a tambourine and dancing. So if you're ever wondering, is dancing an appropriate response of worship to who God is? Not unless you have a tambourine. Get serious and then go dance for the Lord. There we go. And and Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. I mean, this is a passage where they are exalting God. They are singing a worship song about the God of war. The champion, the hero, the one who has fought on behalf of his people to overthrow evil. Come on now. That is good news. This is the mighty God, Gibor. This is the nature of God that God wants us to encounter in the Messiah. I mean, of all the different names of God that are possible, and there are many in the Old Testament, and they are all beautiful and powerful, and we should study them all, and God's desire is that we encounter them all. But it is interesting that in this prophetic passage about the Messiah, these four names of God are given Because God has chosen those aspects of his nature to be revealed in the Messiah in a special way that will change our life. Jesus, let's ask ourselves, when we look at the nature of God that the Messiah revealed, did the Messiah reveal the wonderful counselor? You bet he did. Did the Messiah reveal this mighty God of war, a hero, a champion against evil who fights on your behalf? Let's look at the life of Jesus here. In the Gospel of Mark, the first encounter Jesus had, and like like a good movie, like a good narrative, under the direction of the the Holy Spirit, we have to take appropriate interpretation of the sequence of events at times in the Gospels. When this is the first time that Jesus encounters physical suffering and has a conversation with someone who is suffering under the oppression of sickness and disease. This is the first conversation Jesus has had with that kind of a person. This is meant to be an introduction to that topic. This is meant to be a summary of how Jesus is wanting to reveal the heart and nature of God in regards to sickness and disease. 
So we take it very seriously. This is not by happenstance. Just like the very first words of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark in verses 1, 14, and 15 are, the kingdom of God is at hand. So repent and believe in this good news. And how did Mark summarize that? He said, Jesus went everywhere proclaiming the gospel. And what did Jesus say? The, essentially, the summary of the gospel is that the kingdom of God, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. So repent and believe in the good news. That is a summary, as Steve Seward says in our leader's discipleship group, and the rest of the gospels are just details. It's very true. The rest of the Gospels are a living out of what Jesus is talking about, that the Gospel is, the good news is, that the kingdom of God is right here at hand. The time is fulfilled. So your job is to repent and believe in this good news. So similarly, right here, Jesus' response when he encounters someone suffering under the oppression of sickness and disease. Let's go to it. Mark 1, 40 and 42, a leper came to him, imploring him, which means old word, begging, kneeling before him. So in other words, Jesus walks by a, a man who is suffering under the impression, uh, oppression of a sickness and disease they called leprosy at the time, which caused him to be outcasted, untouchable, not worthy of a hug, not worthy of a kiss, not worthy of an embrace. The thought was, oh, you must be under the judgment of God. You must be so sinful that God is judging you for your sins right now with this disease that not only causes you all sorts of pain and suffering, but the emotional, the relational is even far greater. You are outcasted from everything meaningful. You are cut off from relationship. You must just go suffer alone. And we saw in the pandemic in the last two years what that does to the human soul. And so the belief was God's doing this to you on purpose. And it says, so there's coming to, his, to Jesus, falling on his knees, begging him, says, if you are willing, man, there's a question, or there's a statement. If you are willing, God... Messiah, you can make me whole. You can make me clean. It says, moved with pity, moved with compassion. Some translations say, Jesus stretched out his hand and he touched him, which was illegal, by the way, especially for a rabbi, one who is clean. Oh, man, Jesus is a feisty fighter, isn't he? It says, oh, it's illegal to touch them. Hey, everybody. He touched him and said, I am willing. Come on now. He is the Messiah. The Messiah is willing that you be made whole. Let me touch you. Does Jesus reveal the heart of God or does he not? Immediately, the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. He was made whole. Now, this gets super interesting. I'm going to geek out here for a moment into the Greek and stuff, but this is one of those passages where it's like there's reasons why, you know, God put the fivefold ministry of, you know, pastors and teachers and apostles and prophets and evangelists. Sometimes not everybody needs to do it, but some need to get into all the depths of context and language and study and teaching to be able to get out some nuggets. And so this is one of those passages where, wow, wow. When you get into the original manuscripts, the heart, the nature of God is revealed. Let's, so go with me on a very fun little journey real quick here. It says that Jesus was filled with compassion or pity. That's good. Compassion is good. Compassion in the, in the biblical sense is a gut-level response where you, you, you feel what other people are feeling. 
Like we say today, if you could walk in my shoes for a day. And that's good. That's a very, very healthy human response to suffering is compassion where you would, in a sense, you would put yourself in their place. What does it feel like to be them before I cast any judgment, before I, you know, just tell them it's their own fault, like this, this, this leper suffering judgment, very little compassion. The assumption in that culture was, well, God must be really mad at you for all your sin. Never really, it seems, did lepers experience compassion where people would slow down enough just to say, regardless of, of, of whether that's not even true, which it's, Jesus shows it's not, what is it like to, to walk in their shoes? What would it feel like to spend a day where they're at? Now, if we can all start in, with, instead of judgment with compassion, we're going to go a very long way to represent Jesus in the world. But Jesus goes even, even deeper than that here. Compassion is not actually the word that's used here in the original manuscripts of the Gospel of Luke. Now, this is, this is where it gets a little weird and technical, but it's fascinating. A little bit later, a few centuries later, in the manuscripts of Mark, the word compassion is in there. In the original manuscripts that are a few centuries earlier than that, which makes it obvious that that's the real one, a very a different word is used. Now, when I say manuscripts, it's because they didn't have computer documents where it is just, you know, write down the words of Jesus and publish it. It was everything was written on these scrolls, and then they were passed from one generation to another. So the whatever's written on the earliest scroll available, you know that that's the true one, because later on, as a new word gets inserted, and it's like, wait, we know that this is an older one by carbon dating and various things, so they change the word. So in, let me just give you a quick example of what's going on. So Mark 6.34, it says, Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd, he had compassion on them. Now that's good. That's the word compassion, that is the word, doesn't really matter, splankidzomai. It's a word that's used very frequently throughout the Gospels for compassion. And this is where it's that gut-level sense of, I'm going to walk in your shoes. I'm going to feel what you feel. And that's where it says, Jesus had compassion on them because they were sheep without a shepherd. So, instead of judging them that, hey, that's a big group of sinners, it says, Jesus felt for a moment. He slowed down to feel what they feel. What is it that they're feeling? They're feeling lost. They're feeling harassed. They're feeling helpless. They're feeling like sheep without a shepherd. And because of that, Jesus, because of the compassion, he calibrated his response appropriately. Now, when he felt what the Pharisees were feeling against him, which is probably arrogant judgment, he blasted them because that's what they needed in the moment. They thought they were leaders. They were leaders. They thought they were supposed to lead everybody with this arrogance that they knew it all. So Jesus blasted them. When he comes across a crowd full of sinners and feels that they feel lost, harassed, and helpless, oh, man, he had a very different response. He said, I want to be like the mother hen who gathers your chicks together. So it starts with compassion. But back to our study here, what's very interesting is that Mark intentionally did not use the word splakidzomai or whatever it is, compassion in Mark 141. Jesus, or excuse me, Mark uses a different word to describe the response of Jesus. The original manuscripts have the word orgidzo. You know what that word means? Oh, so good. To arouse with anger and ready to fight. So let's think through this. It's, it's kind of like compassion, but with a further extent of there's a holy anger rising up to fight against evil. 
So when Laura shares last week about the reality of 40 million people in this world are human trafficked, many of them minors, many of them young girls forced into sexual slavery, that should not just invoke in us compassion where we feel what they feel and how tragic. That should go to a next holy level of orgidzo. That's a holy anger that rises up to say, I am going to fight against this evil. There is a time and a place for the man of war to be made known in this world. Man, this is the wrong day to not be able to yell. But you need to feel it with me. Feel it for me, please. So, Jesus encounters a man living under the oppression of sickness and diseased and and being excommunicated from relationship, being told he's untouchable, being forced to live in isolation. So all that comes with being lonely and told that you are not worthy of touch, you are not worthy of love, worthy of embrace. All of the suffering in your life is because the sin, the wrath of God is upon you because you deserve it. And that whole worldview, when Jesus saw a leper and says, are you willing, Messiah? What, what is God's perspective on me, Messiah? You see my plight. You see my cry. Is the world right about me? And it roused a holy anger in God incarnate. God was angry at what this man had endured, both physically and emotionally, socially. It aroused anger in the Messiah. It caused him to want to fight. So what is he fighting? Is he fighting this man? Is he mad at the man? No. Because when Jesus is roused to fight and then he does something, you're going to know who his enemy is. So if in any way this anger was against the man, you would know it. It's not. It's against the lies that this man has been told about God. You're not touchable. You are under the wrath of God because you're a sinner, and therefore you're sick and you're untouchable. And those are the two things that goes after. Jesus goes after in a holy anger, fighting against the lies, fighting against the evil. He touches him to say that perspective that you have on God, that everyone else has on God about you and your social nature and your identity and how you're not worthy to be touched and you should be outcasted and that's what God wants for you, that's a lie. And let me show you as a man of war and all I have to do is touch you. And then as far as sickness and disease, be whole. That's not a gift from God either. It's very simple. (laughs) Ow. (laughs) this man's question embodies one of the most vulnerable questions of humanity if you will you can make me clean if you're willing messiah representing the nature of god So this is where you put yourself in the question. That's what the Bible's for. Put yourself in the text. That's what the narratives are about. These are the stories. These are the questions and answers of all of humanity. What is God like? This man is representing humanity in the very vulnerable, painful place of suffering under the oppression of sickness and disease and then all its ramifications into being social and outcast and all of that, this very human, vulnerable, painful question of, God, do you care? God, what do you think about my situation? If you were here right now, God, would you be willing to heal me? Or is everybody else right about who you are and then who I am. Would you, God, fight on my behalf? 
or would you leave me as I am? This man is representing humanity and the question of suffering in this broken and fallen world. And Jesus, the Messiah, who is here to reveal the nature of God in an incredibly simple but profound moment, says, I am willing. He reaches out and touches, and he says, be whole. In this exchange, we have a revelation of the mighty God, the Gibor, the mighty God who is here to fight on our behalf. Jesus' words and actions reveal a God who is stirred up with holy anger in order to fight on our behalf and make us whole, make us complete. That is shalom. This is an incredible word that Jesus uses at places. It's this whole concept of God's blessing upon the world. It's where Jesus says he goes into a home and you pronounce peace. You pronounce shalom. The Hebrew word means wholeness. Lacking nothing. Complete well-being. And so when Jesus looks at this man who is suffering both in the emotional sense, in the social sense, in his identity as being told he's worthy of, In some way, God is doing this on purpose because of his sin. And then there's the whole physical side of it, which his whole life has changed and been transformed, and he is suffering under this oppression of sickness and disease. And Jesus models the heart of the Father. And says, I am a man of war to make you whole. These are the kind of things, these are the kind of narratives, the kind of stories, the kind of encounters that we are supposed to take to the bank of who God is. This is not one of those, oh, well, I'm not a leper, so this doesn't apply to me. Well, have you ever suffered under the brokenness of this world and wondered, is God willing to heal? Does God care? Have you ever suffered under being pushed out, being separated from community, being excommunicated, and those around you say you're not worthy of love, you're not worthy to be touched, you're not worthy to be part of the in-group, you've got some sin that, that God is causing you to suffer for because of your wrongdoing, and you are not worthy, so stay out there. And you say, God, what do you have to say? Do you care? Are you willing? Do you know the God who, when he sees your suffering, is roused to a holy anger like a hero, like a champion, like a seasoned warrior in battle who wants to come and fight for you, not against you, to make you whole? in every way you can imagine. That is the nature of God revealed in Jesus. Let me give you just a a personal example, a personal application from, from this week. And how do you believe in God Revealed in Jesus as the mighty God, the Gibor. I know that's not a very pleasant word to say. The hero, the champion, the one who comes all the way from heaven to earth to fight on your behalf, to fight for you, not against you, to fight against evil in whatever form it comes so that more of his kingdom is advanced on earth as it is 
in heaven. Where there is no sickness, there is no disease, there are no outcasts, there are no untouchables, there are no unlovables, there are none who not worthy of a hug, of a kiss, of an embrace. How do you believe that when your current circumstances say otherwise? That's the challenge, isn't it? Now, it wouldn't be a lot easier if our lives looked like the leper where the first time we asked Jesus, it all changed. Right? I've got this going on. Are you willing? Bam! Well, then it's a lot easier to believe that he is the man of war, a hero, a champion, fighting against every kind of evil on our behalf. But when you pray and you're suffering, whether it's the social, it's the emotional, the social, emotional, physical, whatever it may be, you pray and you don't feel the God of war immediately set you free and you don't see the hero, the champion, fighting on your behalf against evil then what do you do? And I just want to share a quick example from this week. So as I told you guys, this has been a very difficult week in our house, specifically in the realm of physical suffering. My, my wife has been missed two weeks of church because of a physical suffering that's been long. It's been years. Unfortunately, it's been several years. I don't even like to talk about it and get, go through all the specifics of it because it's just an attack of the enemy is the bottom line, part of the broken and fallen world. But certain things she is very allergic to and sensitive to now in this world to where she eats the wrong thing. And you know, the next thing you know, for two weeks, she's got so much pain in her stomach that she's up till 6 or 7 a.m. every single night because she can't sleep. So when you're living off of like an hour or two of sleep for like two weeks straight, you're suffering. You're not doing good. I mean, I don't like it if I get less than eight, you know? I'm grumpy, and I feel very justified in having an excuse. Science says I need eight. We'll try going off one or two for two weeks. I mean, that's, that's a hard way to live. And then our oldest son had a surgery on his mouth, and there are some complications with that where he's, he's all the way over in Catalina, so his mom and dad, we can't help. That feels the feelings of helplessness, and he's got like this open bone wound that's lacerating his tongue, and he's in pain and it's getting worse. Is it getting infected? Oh, there's no doctors over there. There's like a vet and animal clinic, you know, like you go get some like, you know, horse juice or something. I don't know. It's not good for mom and dad. You know, you have your kids suffering and they're not home. You can't do anything. And then, you know, I got this rib thing going on that I I thought it was okay. I got head butted playing basketball with my 15 year old son and it really hurt, but it was kind of getting better. And then something happened Thursday this week where maybe I got too excited cheering for him where I don't know, it, they, it just went exponential. I thought I was going to have to go to the ER. I was like, nah, I just got broken ribs. They can't do anything, so it's just pain. It's fine. But I started getting dizzy. I started having tingles in the extremities, and, and the pain was, like, wild. So I was, like, ER contemplating on Thursday night. So this, this is like, hey, we're having a fun week, aren't we, you know? But everybody, you, got, you, all got, you all have those weeks. You all have those months. Some of you have those years. And it might not be physical. It might be emotional. It might, be, it might be social. It might be that spiritual. It might be like, man, I'm longing for that breakthrough. Where is the God of war on my behalf? And that's an honest, legitimate question. When we suffer and we pray and we don't see the God of war immediately come and act on our behalf, what happens? Two things. And I know this sounds harsh, but this is the, this is the truth. One, you can either have faith that God is who he says he is, as revealed in Jesus, or you can change your understanding of God because it's too hard to believe it. And the struggle of that is okay. There's no condemnation here. This is what God's word says about that. Romans 8, 31 and 32 Help us in these moments. What shall we say to all these things? And Romans 8 is all these things. It's this ridiculous, glorious, all these blessings of who God is, the promises of God that are utterly ridiculous in Christ. And then it goes on to say, 
Here we go. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with his son, graciously give us all things? And so here's the idea. The point is, God already went to the greatest extent he could possibly do to show you that he is the God of war on your behalf. The greatest thing in all of heaven, hell, and earth, the God of the universe could do to show you that he is for you and not against you, that he is the God of war fighting on your behalf against evil is that he could sacrifice his own son. There's nothing greater that God, the God of the universe, there's nothing greater than he could do than his send his own son to die to demonstrate that he is for you, not against you. And, and, and because he's done that, what does it say? He's going to also, along with his own son, he's going to give us everything. And so when we're in those moments, when we're like, oh, does God care about this situation? That's when you go to Romans 8. When God, does God care about my physical suffering right now? Does God care about my social suffering? Does God care about providing for me? Does God care about my emotional well-being? Does God care about this painful relationship? I'm praying to the God of war who's supposed to fight on my behalf, and I haven't seen the change yet. So does God care? Does God even care? Romans 8 says you already have the answer. You already have the answer. And not to be rude, but the answer is it's not about your circumstances right now. That's not the answer. The answer is yes, I've sent my son. I made the greatest sacrifice God could make. I allowed my son to suffer on your behalf through hell for you. So the answer is, to your question, at any point in life where you're saying, does God care about human suffering, my suffering, my pain, my situation? The answer is yes, because he sent his son to go through hell on your behalf. That should be the trump card. That should be the, it's done after that. The question of whether or not God cares is over, because he sent his son to go through hell for me. And everything else after that is a far lesser thing. And so I can be confident that just as he gave his own son, which answers the, the question in my soul, I can also know that everything else matters as well. But it's a lesser thing. He's going to give me everything because he gave his son, and that cost him everything. And so that's where our faith comes in, where we can hold on to the promise that he is the God of war. He is fighting on our behalf. And I'm not wanting to get into the whole thing, and I'm not saying like, oh, you don't have enough faith, and that's why you haven't seen the breakthrough yet. I'm not saying that. That's a, that's a whole nother thing. Our faith matters in that, but that's not what I'm going after today. I'm going after that question that's deep in our soul where we, we suffer, we hurt, we feel it, we're wondering, where is God? Does he care? Is he that man of war on my behalf? And that's where he is saying, believe me. For your own soul's good, believe me. And are there times where you have to wait? Yes. And there's a thousand reasons why. One is because there is spiritual warfare coming against you every single day. We see that. That's all over God's word. Why is a fruit of the spirit perseverance waiting in the storm? believing in the storm. Because we live in a broken, fallen world where, God, where Jesus himself said, Satan is the God of this world. Still, well, that's a terrifying reality. But it doesn't change God's heart that he is the man of war who has come into this world to fight on your behalf against any and all evil, brokenness, fallenness, 
that you find in your life. And so for our family, even this week, that's how we get through these things. And my wife and I are even like laughing at it in a way. And I'm honest, like, man, I, I, her faith's incredible. She is that Proverbs 31 woman to me who is able to look at the future and laugh. We were laughing about it because it's like, yeah, we're, we're like a pathetic little group of hobbling idiots right now that like can't even get the dishes done or pack somebody's lunches. I'm like reaching for the lunchbox. We're like, oh, and she's like, I got two hours of sleep. Oh, it's a pathetic scene in our house. But we're laughing because we're like, if this changes nothing about the God of war who fights on our behalf. And we're able to worship together to put on worship music together, to laugh together, to pray, to take communion together and say, this changes nothing about the nature of God. Jesus is the God of war who fights on our behalf, who's fighting for our son out in Catalina, who's fighting to heal her, who's fighting to heal our ribs, who's fighting on behalf of this church. We don't have to see it immediately to believe it. God sent his son and went through hell on our behalf so we would believe it. So let's believe it even when we haven't seen it. He is the God of war who is for you, not against you, fighting on your behalf to see the kingdom of God come on earth as it is in heaven until it's fully done and you are made whole. Come on, let's pray. <laughs> Ow, don't make me laugh. Jesus, we, we, we are in awe of how you reveal the nature of God. We are in awe of what you reveal about the nature of God. And we want to come to you this morning, Lord. There's two characters that come to mind in the, in the Gospels. One is that father who comes and says, I believe, help my unbelief. And you know what? That was enough for his son to get healed. So there is part of it right there. It's not perfect faith to see your kingdom come. We're strugglers, Lord. We don't have it all together, so we want to come. And the second person that's coming to mind is that the leper who just all he could muster up was falling before your knees and begging and saying, are you willing? If you're willing. That's not a huge, bold prayer of faith either. So we want to offer ourselves like those two characters right there, God. We want to say, help our unbelief, and we want to surrender before you and say, help us. We ask that your Holy Spirit would, right now, in this moment, in this message, in this day, that you would be, by your Holy Spirit, bringing revelation once and for all that seals in our heart that you are the mighty God that Jesus reveals, the Messiah, our Messiah reveals a mighty God who is a hero, a champion, a man of war who fights on our behalf against evil, who fights for us, not against us, who fights so that the kingdom of God will break into our life and touch and transform every area of life on earth as it is in heaven every area of life is a candidate for your shalom god to be made whole to be made right to be made new god we ask that your spirit would seal it in our bones encounter us this morning god Encounter us with this truth. Holy Spirit, we pray you do it for your glory, Lord, and for transformed lives. Help us, Spirit, take it to the bank when we're ever wondering if you are that champion, that hero that fights for us, not against us. Take us to Romans 8, 31, 32, that reminds us you've answered that question in the most triumphant way ever. You sent your one and only son to, to die and go through hell on our behalf. That is the answer that resounds throughout all eternity. Yes, I am fighting for you, not against you. We 
we worship you. We thank you. What a revelation. What a better way to live than in the fear and the terror and the insecurity that thinks you're fighting against us. Thank you, Jesus, for what you went through to declare to the heavens that you fight for us. Let's just give a quiet moment where in your own way you cry out to God and say, God, make this real. Bring your own cries. Bring your own questions. Bring your own situations. And ask for him to reveal his nature so that you, it's not even about ultimately, it feels like not even faith. It's just we know. I just, it's not I believe it. It's I know this is who he is. I worship him in the storm because I know he fights on our behalf, period. God, bring that revelation where every person in this room can know you in a way they know you are the champion fighting for them and never against them. Be this man of war on behalf of our souls, God. Take a moment. In your own way, just talk to God. I will sing a new song. I will sing a new song. I will dance a new dance like David.